Coming up next is Twitch. This week in computer hardware. This week, Ryan and I talk about why you better wait three weeks before you buy a new notebook. Hint, it's called Sandy Bridge. Using an HDTV as a computer monitor, and if SSDs are less reliable than hard drives, and what to do when the magic smoke leaks out of your motherboard. Coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 98, recorded December 9th, 2010. Wait for Sandy Bridge. This episode of Twitch is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off the lifetime of your new account, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TWITCH. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I am Patrick Norton. Joining me as always, Mr. Ryan Shrout. Are you there, Hello. sir? I, I am indeed. I am. I have powerful news. Uh, as of this morning, apparently, the beloved This Week in Computer Hardware podcast joins Freakonomics Radio, The Nerdist, WorkoutMusic.com, <laughs> Tech News Today, The Joe Rogan Experience, Jay and Silent Bob Get Old, The Smodcast, uh, and quite a few others as a uh, iTunes Best of 2000 – or iTunes 2000 Town 2010 Best of Audio Podcast. So you are elite, That's dude. That's good news. That's good news for us, isn't it? It is good news. Hopefully so we're going to remind means the new subscribers will be streaming in as well. There'll be a for everyone who's new to the podcast after we were listed on uh, iTunes. That's right. Uh, I'd like to say we talk about computer hardware, computers. Well, computer hardware, pretty much. How to make it run faster. How to make it work better. Uh, how to basically not get screwed when you're whipping out the credit card or the cash to pay for your new toy. And uh, we take a lot of viewer questions. So do us a favor, email us your viewer questions. You can send it to us on Twitter. I'm at Patrick Norton. Uh, where Where are you at, Mr. Shroud, on the Twitter? A very creatively named at Ryan Trout on Twitter as well. And you can also email us at twitch at twit.tv. As we are wont to do, we are going to begin this episode with yet another graphics card review. The NVIDIA GeForce ETX 571, <laughs> 1.25 gigabytes. It's something new. I was kind of hoping for a 2 gigabyte GPU review. Why one and a quarter gigabytes? Or is that a typo? You trying to tell me you're not excited about new graphics cards every week? It's not every week, but we, we, do, we do seem to leave with graphics cards quite a bit, don't we? I'm ready for a sort of a, and what, you know what I mean? I think everybody's kind of released everything. Then they're going to do a bunch of announcements about products that aren't going to exist for six months. There's going to be a lot of Sandy Bridge happiness at CES 2011 in a few we'll weeks. I've, I'm, I'm waiting for a sort of a, just a gentle pause where we can all stop and decide to buy GPUs before they start ramping up with all new – well, actually, whether or not they're ramping up with all new silicon later this year, you're going to comment on that in a minute. But tell us now, is it safe to buy a GPU, and should we be looking at the GTX 570? I would say, um, editor's note, probably leading with a <laughs> graphics card next week as well. Um, <laughs> so we'll keep that in mind. Damn but it, the lull between the cards, it keeps evading us. <laughs> after that, I think we'll have a lull for a little while. Not an okay. LOL, but an LAWL, if I spelled that correctly. Um, but the GTX 570, so this is based on the GF110 GPU, the same, almost the same GPU as the GTX 580 we talked about a couple, three weeks ago. Um, that GPU was 1.5 gigabytes. This is 1.25 gigabytes memory size, as you mentioned. And the reason for that it has, is because it has a slightly smaller memory bus width. So instead of having a 384-bit memory bus, it has a 320-bit memory bus. And when that happens, it just kind of works out so that X number of memory per memory channel, which is like a division of 64 bits of memory. Um, so in this case, 256 megs of memory fewer channels so therefore there is that much fewer or that much less frame buffer on there still a good amount um, i still think the norm is probably now a gigabyte um, there are some cards that have two gigabytes 
Uh, there are some cards that are coming out that have two gigabytes as well, but there are some out there that have two gigs. It's kind of frame buffer is one of those things. It's only really important if you're doing ultra, ultra high res where you are pushing anti-aliasing levels to the highest maximum, like uh, edge adaptive, uh, not just multi-sample, but maybe coverage sample AA. When you're doing all kinds of AAs to get the top most image quality you can, that's when it becomes important. Um, the 570 compared to the 580 has one less streaming multiprocessor, which means it has fewer shader cores in it. This has 480 shader processors, CUDA cores as NVIDIA calls them, compared to the 512 cores on the GTX 580. So this is basically almost equivalent to the previous, remember the GTX 480 was the super high-end part in the last, I don't want to say last generation, but the last release. This is almost equivalent to that in terms of performance and specs. There's a couple of minor differences with the memory mm -hmm. and, and uh, raster operators and stuff like that that we don't need to get into. In terms of performance, it's very, very, right. very similar. Beats it in most cases, falls behind it in just a couple of cases, but we're talking handful of percentages difference between this and the 480. Uh, the benefit, of course, to this is that this is a, as comes at a lower price. It starts at 349 is kind of the estimated MSRP on this part. Whereas mm -hmm. the 480, as of yesterday, the day before, was selling for 430, 440. So we're seeing like a good 70 to 80 dollar price drop for the same performance nice. with the GTX 570. And the 480s are not, you know, they're basically end of life. What's about what's out there now? You know, if you're if you want a second one to do SLI, start paying attention to that. As as stock is gone, it will not be coming back. So that's kind <laughs> of an important there. safety tip. So yeah, Future yeah, Mark yeah. 3D Mark 11 DXX D, if the DirectX 11 testing gets more robust, gets more real. Are you guys going to be immediately flipping over to this, or just add it to the suite along time alongside the current Future Mark benchmarks? So what we'll probably do is add 3D Mark 11 to our benchmark suite in the next review cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't want to just three mark vantage has been around for a long time and it is it is definitely long in the tooth uh, it has very f few kind of direct x10 features 3d mark 11 not only 11 not only stands for 2011 which is you know we're almost to that year but it also stands for dx11 because you have to have a dx11 capable graphics card to run this benchmark with you know to in order to get a default run a default mm -hmm. uh, benchmark score you have to have a dx11 ready graphics card um this has also been in development for a long time, but Vantage is still important because so many people have that software. So many people have uh, results based on that software that it's good uh, kind of legacy information to keep around. So even as AMD and NVIDIA release new parts, probably for the next maybe 12 months, we'll have results from that. 3D Mark 11 is one of those things where, you know, we're at a 1.0 version release. It's really pretty to look at. You know, you can go to futuremark.com and download the, the free version of it and play it back. And, and watch it on your hardware, which is always nice. Um, it's good, like, graphical demo, if nothing else. But as with all 1.0 software, we kind of worry about uh, if 1.01 or 1.1 uh, will, will slightly tweak the way the benchmark results right. come out. So we're not going to put a whole lot of stock into the results yet, but we got to start gathering them. So we, if we're gathering them, we might as well present them to our listeners and readers and stuff. There's nothing worse than like doing a whole bunch of benchmarking. Basically, do a whole bunch of benchmarking, and then the update to the benchmark comes out to fix things, and you find out it, it varies more than, like you know, three percent back in the day when we were running a lot of the ZD benchmarks. Um, like three percent was the margin of statistical insignificance, but anything over three percent, and you had to retest everything from the old days or from mm -hmm. the older machines. Um, yeah, that's a, a having to retest everything because the benchmark changes significantly is a giant bag of suck it is it um, is uh, but 3d but mark is one of those kind of industry standards which right. is kind of disappointing because we we like real world gaming testing uh the rest of the world likes these tests that you can click a button run come back get a score <laughs> it's quick it's easy um those types of things and those are important for s some things right uh it's, it's important for just quick glances at, at performance and, and evaluations so you know we're going to use it and they present interesting synthetic benchmarks you know specific very, very individualized tests on certain things that are always good to compare GPU architectures. Um, so they can, if you guys check uh, next week or the next couple of weeks, we'll have some 3D Mark 11 
testing in some of our upcoming articles. So Nice. So one of the articles I noticed this week that kind of stood out, uh, Nantech.com did a roundup of 1,000 to 12,000, 1,000 to 12,000 watts, 1,000 to 12, 12,000 watt. Yeah, that would be scary. Um, just thinking about the amount of amperage that would be sucking through your socket before <laughs> the circuit breakers blew. Uh, they did a, a roundup of 1,000 watts, 1,200 watts, uh, basically high-end uh, PSUs. And it's really funny because mm -hmm. I see a lot of people that are running around with very modest systems, but they've got a 1,000 watt power supply because they need the overhead and the reality is, is if you're not running like three to four gpus in a in a stack of hard drives you do not need a thousand watt much less a 1200 watt power supply um but one of the other things i found out is is kind of every time i see somebody do a really serious roundup of power supplies uh, comes back to one of the problems I've been seeing ever since people started doing serious power supply testing is that a lot of power supplies suck and I bring yeah. that up partially because a poorly engineered power supply, uh, there can be voltage variations, there can be ripple, um, there can be you know, heating problems, it can be incredibly inefficient. Uh, and I bring that up because a lot of things we blame on like my hard drive sucks or Windows sucks or OS X sucks can actually be related back to problems with the power that hits the motherboard and then the hard drive. And basically, there's basically you need a good power supply to have an overall solid computing experience especially mm -hmm. if you want nice, safe data. Um, yeah. I'm not going to get too deep into it because I want people to go read the article for themselves. Um, but it was shocking. They did five fairly pricey uh, power supply units, and the the line I'm going to leave everybody with is, at the moment, many manufacturers want to reach 80-plus gold faster than the competition, which is why we're seeing problems with the design because they're in such a rush they don't have yes. time to correct their mistakes. So I'm going to leave that little teaser for you to go over to anantech.com and check that one out. Um, they, they do have an editor's choice uh, with reservations. So if you are thinking about buying a gigantic power supply for your gigantic uh, gaming machine with multiple GPUs and, and hard drives, uh, I would highly recommend checking out the testing before I did so. Because uh, some of the power supplies out there suck a lot more than they need to, at least for the money <laughs> they're paying. <laughs> Figuratively and uh, actually. Oh, my goodness. We should take a quick ad break, and then we're going to come back with an uh, email from Kyle, who is suffering from the pain of a dead motherboard and potentially a dead CPU. And uh, a lot of questions about Sandy Bridge, which is uh, them, Intel's, Intel's next-gen uh, processor. As you mentioned, this episode is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high-quality website or blog. Squarespace.com has an easy-to-use user interface for creating and managing a website or blog. It's optimized for both beginners and CSS experts, so if you want to get down into the nitty-gritty nitty of coding, you can actually do that. Or you can use uh, one of their hundreds of design templates uh, and, and customize them as you see fit. Uh, it's an all-inclusive service. It includes several modules to build your uh, website, including blogs, import and export for WordPress, Blogger, Movable Type, TypePad. It has forums. It has a form builder, so you can collect email addresses or other information from your site visitors. It has Flickr photo display, Twitter widgets, Google Maps, a whole lot more. It also does website tracking and built-in search engine optimization, permission access handling if you want to have multiple users uh, update the site if you've got if you you and your friends want to start a, a multi-user blog. It's based on a cloud architecture for speed and site stability, which basically means if you guys get a lot of traffic, even as you're growing, you don't have to worry about your site being shut down or your server being overwhelmed uh, because of additional traffic. The the cloud architecture they have is built just for that. It has an innovative drag and drop AJAX interface. So so if you don't know code, but you have an idea about what you want to do design, maybe this block should go over here, this column should move over here. Uh, it has a really easy kind of drag and drop functionality there for you to do some of those kinds of modifications. It has an iPhone app where you can log in your website and update it on the go without having to load up the whole page. That's pretty handy. Uh, so you can use Squarespace for all of your website needs. Build it, host it, and update it at any time. For a free trial, all you have to do is go to squarespace.com. Squarespace uh, no credit card needed. Just try it out and build your website. You get two free weeks. You get to see all the configuration options you can have, what kind of customizations you want. And then if you decide to purchase it, if you use offer code TWITCH, 
you get 10% off of the lifetime of your account. So for as long as you have an account with them, you'll get 10% off of your services. That's squarespace.com, offer code TWITCH, T-W-I-C-H, and we thank them for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. <laughs> Oh, not to laugh at Squarespace. Squarespace is an amazing system for web hosting. Um, it is. But I'm, I'm just laughing. Like the opening to Kyle's uh, email, uh, he's got a quick question. Right? Basically, he opens up a quick question. Is my CPU dead? I've got a Gigabyte GA X58 USB 3, change the cooler of the i7-950 to a Zygmatech Thor's Hammer, which is a ridiculous name for a, a cooler. <laughs> I just want to, I said to say that. Thor's Hammer! I'm just not getting the whole icy hammer of Thor cooling your CPU angle. I says, when I started, it got a smell of smoke and then brought it to a friend, removed the CMOS, and then without the CMOS, started it. Fan spun, but got a spark between the USB ports and Northbridge heat pipe. I'm sure the board is dead, but not sure about the CPU. Can't find any shopper friend here in the Philippines who has an X58 board. Hope you can help. Thanks. Um, the easiest way to figure out if the CPU is still alive is to drop it into a, uh, any compatible motherboard and see if the thing boots. If it doesn't boot, uh, it, either in the what I consider particularly alarming fashion, the motherboard will start <laughs> speaking to you through the speaker. I still haven't gotten used to that. The CPU is dead. Um, more likely, you'll get a series of beeps uh, that, that you go into the manual and decide is the postcode, the power on self, Ted. You know, right. <laughs> Three dots, a space, three long dots, a space. Oh, that means my CPU is dead. Um, so if we have a, anybody in the Philippines who's got access to an X58 board and is brave enough uh, to to <laughs> let Kyle drop his CPU in there to see if the CPU is dead, um, give him a shot. I mean, the thing is, Kyle, is as is, is painful as this is, you can, you know, I, I would say call Gigabyte, see if you can do an RMA on the board. Um, you know, hopefully, I, I, I've I've had a couple boards go on me in the last few years. Um, mm -hmm. One went quietly, one went not so quietly. Seeing sparks <laughs> uh, between the USB ports and the Northbridge heat pipe is a little unusual. Um, yes. Yeah, is 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 extremely unusable. I would call Gigabyte. I would be very polite. Said my my motherboard exploded, and I would like uh, to replace it. Uh, <laughs> and they will probably give you an RMA number. And then hopefully, right. when you get the motherboard back, uh, you will drop your 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 CPU into it, and everything will your i7 950, and everything will run. Um, I'm kind of 50-50, like, I want to tell you there's a, it's a 98% possibility that your CPU is fine, um, but when you're talking about enough, um, you know, the magic smoke comes out, so probably a little tiny capacitor or resistor blew out on the motherboard, one of those tiny little surface mount components. It's all it takes is one little piece of yep. silicon that's about a you know, millimeter apart, and your motherboard becomes, like, the world's most useless paperweight. Um, but I'm going to say 50-50, uh, and I'm going to hope that it's the 50% that your CPU is still alive. Um, you know, nice. it's I mean, because, well, it's kind of funny. Like, CPUs used to be really fragile, and then they got pretty much indestructible. Uh, and then we started overclocking, and then uh, they started getting more destructible. And then AMD decided, let's put the silicon on the outside of the chip with nothing protecting it. And then I discovered how easy it was to crack silicon. Um, well, they don't do that anymore, though. No, they don't, uh, and uh, nobody does that anymore. It's really expensive um, in terms of uh, really angry users. But you know, <laughs> CPUs are pretty hard to kill these days. But an overvoltage is is one way to do it. Um, I'm hoping everything's fine. Call Gigabyte. Hopefully, they'll RMA you a new motherboard and uh, drop your CPU in there and see if that helps. And if anybody out there in the Philippines uh, has an X58 board that they're willing to let Kyle drop his i7-950 into, do us a favor. Email us twitch at twit.tv, and we'll try to get you guys hooked up, see if we can take care of Kyle. There you go. Uh, we got a message from Android Bruce on Twitter says, is there any proof that an SSD is less reliable than a hard drive? Should you run your cache on separate disks with an SSD? Uh, is there any proof that an SSD is less, less reliable? I would say no. Um, I'd say there's proof that an SSD is more reliable in terms of like shock resistance and that type of thing. Like I, this is one of those deals where hard drives have been around for decades, uh, spinning disks. We have lots of data. Of, of you know millions of hours of real world usage and end user usage and SSDs are still relatively new even though it feels like I've been talking about them forever. 
<laughs> it's only it's only been a couple three years. Um, I don't. It, it, I can't for sure say if they're, if they're less or more reliable. I would lean with more reliable. And I can tell you that everybody that I know, I recommend SSDs to everybody. Our, our storage guru, Alan, who would, would not risk losing his many, many terabytes of data or time for that matter, would, would not be using them if he didn't feel like they're reliable. As for mm-hmm. uh, running your cache on separate disks, I'm not exactly sure what he's talking about. I think he might be like Windows Swap. Partition file, most likely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the the issue that that comes into is, are you going to wear down the flash memory itself over time if you use it as as a swap drive? And and yeah, you're going to wear it down faster. But it's the same thing as like saying, is overclocking my CPU, if it's <laughs> running at the right temperature, is really going to lower the lifespan of my processor? And the answer is probably yes. But if you're going to take it from 20 years to five years, or 20 years to 10 years, eh. You know, do you is that does that really matter? I I still think um, that a lot of the concerns and stuff over SSDs are are a little bit blown out of proportion, if not a lot of it, yeah. blown out of proportion, right now. Yeah, I mean it's interesting. There was a there's a big deal around this when when uh, the XM25 was was still really kind of the the let's let's call it a year ago, eight months ago, uh, forever ago, as Ryan would say in in terms of covering SSDs. Right. Um, and part of the problem is, is everybody knows, well, I can, you know, the flash memory or some of the flash, you know, everybody understands the idea that flash memory can wear out. Therefore, flash memory is not durable. And the reality is that somebody like Intel is dealing with huge manufacturers who want assurances that this stuff is going to last. And uh, OEMs basically wanted, you know, people like Dell and HP and Apple, they wanted to know that uh, an SSD would have a reasonable lifespan. So they came up, it's really funny, um, Intel decided they wanted to represent uh, SSD lifespan um, in terms of the amount of gigabytes per day you could write. So they kind of went back and forth, and the OEMs and Intel decided that 20 gigabytes a day was like a typical amount. Uh, Hmm. And you would be able to write 20 gigabytes a day for five years, and your drive would last. So Intel basically did the math, and they're claiming um, you can write 100 gigabytes to one of its uh, SSDs every day for the next five years, and your <laughs> your data will remain <laughs> intact. Um, and and that's the the problem, right? Is when you're looking at you know everybody knows somebody who has had a hard drive die, or at least has heard of somebody. Uh, right. But the reality is statistically, you know. The, the the hard drives are just the hard drives last a really long time. The meantime the meantime between failure is huge, but it's kind of like airplanes. You know the the meantime between ha- failure as in a plane falling out of the sky and, and turning into a crater. Um, you know it's statistically it's much much safer than a car crash, but people panic a lot more about uh, airplanes falling out of the sky. You know right. what I mean? Like you know forty two thousand people were killed last year in automobile accidents in the United States alone, uh, but. Every Everybody's nervous about flying. So the the math from Intel and the other manufacturers basically says, you know, Intel especially, that you should easily get five to 25 years out of this. It's silicon. It doesn't really wear out. You know, if you beat it to death with a hammer, if you attach it to like a five amp, you know, power supply off of a neon sign and run 10,000 volts through it, uh, <laughs> if it turns out that Intel did the math wrong and the, and the processor or the, the, the silicon inside wears out, But really, you know, unless there's been some horribly bad engineering and Intel isn't known for that, you should be totally safe using an SSD. In fact, you should be safer because hard drives have spinning parts. They're mechanical devices. Mechanical devices can fail. Anyhow, sorry, I just get kind of excited about that. (laughs) So... (laughs) Pat Factor X, which is definitely not me, tweets, Ryan Shrout, Patrick Norton, should I get an i5 right now or wait for Sandy Bridge? When will we start seeing chips at builder shops? This is an easy answer. Uh, You should wait, (laughs) right? I mean, we're literally like three weeks away from the the release. Um, and, And with this launch... You will see parts at like Newegg, Fry's, Micro Center, if not day of, if not days before, to be perfectly honest with you, um, you will see them within the week after their launch. And Intel's already come out and publicly said that they're going to launch Sandy Bridge processors on January 6th, I believe. So that's when you know you're going to see the reviews, if not before. That's when you know you're going to see benchmarks to decide whether or not the performance difference is worth the price difference. And you should actually see parts 
Um, usually they start selling early, like leaked out at some places, but if not, you know, within seven days of launch. So at this point, it doesn't happen very often where I say you might want to wait because I'm usually one of those people that says, don't bother waiting. There's always something better around the corner. Anyway, no matter when you decide to build in this case, it's like, okay, we know there are new graphics cards coming and we know that there are new processors coming all less than 30 days from now. Uh, I, if you can, I would wait, but if you don't want to, that's your fault. But <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah, think if, that, if, I think that's a pretty good answer. If you don't wait and it turns around your notebook goes on sale for 20% off, or you could have gotten 20% more performance for the same amount of money in three weeks, Ryan's going to laugh at you. I yes. will be sympathetic. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> On that theme, at Jerome Prolux tweets, at Ryan Shroud, at Patrick Norton, if Apple were to dump NVIDIA for Sandy Bridge graphics, would there be savings in electricity and or performance gains? I would hope there would be performance gains over the existing uh, NVIDIA GPUs they're using, but I have not been hands-on yet with Sandy Bridge. Um, it's not, it's not going to be, perform it's, it's, a, it's a really tough question because... Right. It's not that even simple. I, even it's not I don't that have a lot of hands-on time with the NVIDIA or with the Sandy Bridge graphics. In general, I will say that the NVIDIA discrete graphics solutions for mm -hmm. mobile market will be faster than the Sandy Bridge graphics, have better drivers, be more compatible with more games than Sandy Bridge. Um, although, but I don't know. I mean, from all the stuff we've heard, I mean, I... Honestly, I'm just now getting in hardware. I'm not, I'm not, we're not going to be able to talk about performance for a little while, but I do have it in-house. But I haven't spent enough time with it to even know, even if I could say, if it's good enough uh, in terms of graphics performance yet. I mean, the, the reality is, is when you're looking at battery life, the number one, cons the, 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 the component in your notebook that sucks down the most battery life is still your LCD flat panel. What a huge gain in battery life dim the flat panel down to the point where you can just yeah. stand it uh, and then dim it some more. And that's going to do the most for battery life. Um, the, the GPU, unless you're talking about, you know, gaming GPU versus integrated GPU, uh, the performance, or it's just, I should say that the performance gains are huge in terms of like gaming graphics, but the battery life gains are just, you know, I, I could be wrong. Maybe we'll turn around and see a 15 hour Sandy Bridge notebook from Apple, but I'm Eesh. not holding my breath. Yeah, <laughs> we'll see. Speaking of, speaking of laptops, we got an email from uh, Hafizan who says, I have trouble choosing about my future laptop uh, that I would probably end up buying next year in the first quarter, he says. I want to use the laptop probably for travel use, like surfing the web and watching HD movies. And probably probably some on the road light gaming. He's an avid AMD lover, but we all know mm. the current AMD laptops run quite hot. I'm hearing a lot of AMD Fusion in the news, and it's going to be launched in the first quarter in a probable AMD Apple Fusion laptop. No point on telling me about the Atom. Uh, in my experience, it's like watching paint dry. I like that. <laughs> I emphasize on battery life, 10 to 12 inch screen, performance, and a good deal. Is it worth the wait for the next gen laptops Fusion or stick with the cheaper ones? Then, uh, I'm there's a lot of rumors around Apple and the AMD Fusion, but I'm you know they sell they're they're an Intel shop, they're not an Intel shop that is so huge like Dell where they're buying a significant percentage of of Intel's output. I mean they are right. compared to say Bob's PC supply, but. The most they might be doing is is you know spreading rumors that they're thinking about AMD processors uh, to to get a better price out of Intel. That would be my first reaction to those rumors. Um, he doesn't say that he like guarantee he definitely wants an Apple machine. Um, I did play with an AMD Fusion Brazos platform <laughs> laptop, and they are pretty nice. And you are going to talk mm -hmm. about eight plus hours of battery life, which is going to be good. It fits his um, ten to twelve inch screen type of area. I'm excited about those mobile machines. Sandy Bridge, we talked yep. about it before as well. Th those notebooks are going to be ready within Q1 of next year as well. Um, it will be interesting to see how they compare performance and battery life. I mean, that's just... Yeah. Because my X200 laptop that I've had for almost three years now is getting along in the tooth. Parts are falling off because I keep dropping it. My problem. <laughs> uh, debating upgrading to an X201 from Lenovo, but... Mm -hmm. I, but I know Sandy Bridge versions of that are going to be announced at CES and they might be available within three or four months, but they're going to be more expensive. And, you know, I go through the same debate as well. And honestly, I've had, you know, the X201 bookmarked on my browser for a while, but just can't make myself hit that buy button for these exact same reasons. 
Well, I mean, it's it's frustrating. I, I, I've lived on notebooks. Yeah, I've I've had desktops, but I've I've done most of my computing on notebooks since 1992, and they are without us. I can't think of a single example where they do. They they a notebook is a losing proposition. It's like buying a car. You know, you 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 take the notebook. Yeah. You know, you, you drive the car off the lot. You take the notebook out of the store. You lose thirty percent of its value <laughs> right there. Right. Um, True. You know, and then they continue to lose value, and you carry them around, and there's stresses on the frame, and you open and close them, and again, there's moving parts that disintegrate over time. Um, notebooks are essentially doomed by nature. So I would say hold off. You know, find out if Apple, because right now they're they're sort of a partner, which basically means Apple signed up to get information and maybe work with AMD about talking about the thermal specs or the envelopes for the design. And can AMD deliver a, you know, a part for a price that beats out Intel? Um, you know, it'll be fun. And I got to be honest with you, the the Core 2 Duo, uh, you know, the the 13-inch Core Duo, or excuse me, the 13-inch uh, MacBook Air is a phenomenal notebook. My wife's using one. Um, it's it's very well built. The performance is fantastic. The battery life is really solid. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see what else Apple comes out with next year. The iPad 2 is rumored. There's just a whole bunch of stuff uh, in the pipeline coming out from Apple in January and February. Roger, right. <laughs> Dell Inspiron 9300, which has been really great for several years. That's the best case scenario for a notebook. He says it's slowed down a lot recently. He's downloaded an AVI file that has to be extracted. If I download an AVI file that has to be extracted, it takes forever. If I download it to an external drive and then extract it, it is as quick as ever. Also, about three to four times a week when I wake up, it has the blue screen saying it is shut down to keep hardware from being damaged. What are your thoughts? Seems like the problem might be with the internal hard drive. I wonder if you're I mean, one, my first question is, is how full is that hard drive? Because yep. whenever I hear, like, I, I download a file and I have to extract it or, or it takes me forever to move files around or to copy things to and from uh, my notebook, my first thought is, like, you know, do you have, like, is 20% of your notebook empty? Because as soon as you hit around the 80% point on notebook hard drives, things start to get really crammed in there, and especially mm -hmm. with large files because you extracting files takes a fair amount of sort of scratch space to do. Um Two, have you defragged the notebook ever? Uh, I've had noticeable <laughs> performance. <laughs> You're laughing, right? We were just actually talking about this in Texilla this week. We talked about a, we found a free uh, defrag tool. And I'm going to make you go to Texilla.com to find that one because I'm a jerk. But um, <laughs> run the defrag tool on your notebook. Um, cause I've, I've had noticeable, you know, people say, uh, anything, you know, less than 10% defragmenting, there's no point. I've, I've had 5% fragmentation on a drive defragmented it, which is basically, you know, windows kind of pukes information wherever there's an empty spot on the drive and a defragger takes that information and puts it all in one spot so that the head can zip around the hard drive and basically pick up all of the data sequentially rather than having to do random seeks. Um, defragging your, your hard drive can make phenomenal performance improvements if you've been, you know, reading and writing and moving stuff back and forth off that drive for a few years without defragging it. Um, then third, you know, make sure it's not overheating for another reason. You know, run a vacuum against the back vents to make sure half the cat hair in the house hasn't been sucked in there over time. Because uh, you'd be shocked. A little bit of heat will start to drive a notebook insane. And also, again, notebooks, they get moved around, they bend, they start to flex. The, the soldering uh, on the components inside starts to break down. It's tough to keep a notebook alive for a long time. Um, I agree. But, yeah. Make sure, you know, make some space in your hard drive if you haven't. Get it down to about 80% capacity, if not lower. Uh, defrag that puppy as quick as you can. And then uh, give it a shot with downloading those files and see if they, they move a little faster. And if they don't, well, you know, the nice thing is if you upgrade to a hard drive from like a four- or five-year-old hard drive, you will find uh, phenomenal performance improvements from that drive you had from a few years ago and probably a lot more space to put more AVIs in. <laughs> nice. Uh, we got an email from Jason who is discussing TVs as monitors again. He says, hi, guys. Great show. Just recently added your show to the list of Twitch shows I listen to daily. That's important. Everybody should be doing that. I had a comment from show 97. I run a 32-inch LG 1080p TV for my monitor. It wasn't purchased for that, but that's where it ended up. And I have to say, it's great. People come over and see me playing WoW or even just Quake Live and, and are very impressed. It does take a little getting used to in browsing the web. It has also gotten rid of my itch to run multiple monitors because just because I can run at 1080p and have lots of room to have other browser tabs side by side and be able to mm. read them both. So if you have the room, yeah, get a big 1080p TV for a monitor. Also works great for streaming Netflix or Hulu. 
Um, yes, it is absolutely great if you're streaming Netflix or, or Hulu. Um, it is great for video games, um, especially, mm-hmm. you know, if you're like 27, 32 inch, somewhere between 32 inches and 40 inches. And definitely by the time you get to 42 or 46 inch, uh, 1080p is way too low a resolution to be using for a monitor of that size. Um, and also, uh, it's just it, it starts getting to the point where you're reading your way. You know, you're, it kind of looks like you're following a tennis match when you're trying to read data on the screen. Because uh, I've actually been using a 42-inch Sony uh, Bravia uh, 1080p television as a monitor in my testing area uh, for the past couple three weeks, and uh, there's moments when I love it. When I have like, you know, I've got rain meter configured and I've got the document I'm working on and the related documents. But to be honest with you, I want like a 4K monitor. I want considerably higher resolution (laughs) because, you know, 1920 by 1080p, I'm running that on like, you know, 21 inch monitors at home. Now I've got 42 inches of space. So I want to double or triple or quadruple. um, Mm -hmm the number of pixels on that screen. So I will have even, I will literally have this gigantic desktop where I can put all of this information on it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually 32 inches. I'd be down with anything bigger than that. I would really, really want a higher resolution, but yeah, if you can find a monitor for cheap, definitely think about it. Um, yeah, you know, 42 inches is probably though, unless you have a really big desk, that's an interesting thought. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, we got another email from Go. Uh, we'll so we'll go with uh, pronunciation of Gawain about USB I headphones. That was one of the portable- nights. Oh, okay, all right. With portable <laughs> devices and USB headphones, he says I have the Astro A30s and I'm thinking of getting something a little more comfortable. On the air, it becomes irritating after about an hour, even with the A30s. Although the sound is great in the amp rocks. He likes the Logitech G930s. But he's wondering if it's possible to oops possible to get them to work with a portable device as they are USB based. Is there a way to get them to work with a three and a half millimeter jack or is USB the only option? And if not, do they have any comparable suggestions? My main selling points are sound quality, comfort, wireless is not uh, not a must, and durability. <laughs> The Logitech G930s are a really interesting choice. I mean, first short answer is no, unless you have a notebook, um, you know, or, or some other portable device that runs Windows or OS 10, uh, and I assume Linux. Although I haven't played around with with USB audio on Linux in a while, I will try to do that before next week. Um, but unless you have a computer with USB ports uh, that supports USB audio, you are not going to. There's no magic box you can plug in between that, mm-hmm. you know, mini jack, stereo mini jack and your you know, $160 Logitech wireless gaming headset. And that's the other thing that makes me think like, this is, you know, this is a, this is a, a, a sort of a 7.1 emulating headset. It's a wireless 7.1 surround headset, which is a really peculiar choice for um, portable headphones. Um, yeah. The, uh, <laughs> you know, what you really need is a, you know, what you really need is a, a set of relatively indestructible uh you know uh headphones or earbuds and there is a lot of stuff out there um you know because the other thing is like are you actually using a microphone or are you actually i'm wondering maybe if you're using yeah i mean if you know it's you could kind of yeah i mean you could kind of turn a surround that'd be interesting turning a surround sound headset into like the 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 headset for my speaker phone Uh, (laughs) there's an experiment there uh, yeah, it would be a little peculiar. Or though I could probably strap this to the top of the the headphones and and get away with that. But um, you know, what you want to do is just get a nice wired headphone set of headphones. Um, you know, my yeah. personal favorite headphones for under hundred bucks, Grados SR sixties. They sell for about seventy five bucks. They are a classic, awesome, beautiful sounding. Uh, set of headphones they're not great on airplanes because they're open backed part of what makes them extremely efficient and give they, they have a very nice low end punch um they don't work so well in planes because you can hear the plane right through the open panels on the headphones mm-hmm. um now i do want to say it, I, the the adapter he was talking about looking to go f- for the usb to the analog mm-hmm. I, I don't think you can do that no well, no, no, no. no. So, USB, so, so, to, so, USB to analog headsets is easy. It's just a but, but to go from like a a US, yeah, USB headset to a three and a half inch phono jack doesn't just doesn't exist. 
I've no, looked. I mean, because, <laughs> you know, the three and a half millimeter is just taking an analog electrical signal, right? Uh, the USB is taking digital data over that connection uh, and it's doing processing and that kind of stuff. So no, I don't, I you know, did some reading around and I don't think any of those adapters exist. So you're going to have to find, you're, you're going to have to do what Patrick is suggesting here and get another set of headphones. Yeah, I'd be curious. I mean, you know, Cost makes great headphones. Sennheiser makes great headphones. Mm -hmm. I've got a pair of dynamic, uh, biodynamic DT770s I live in. Uh, AKG makes great headphones. If you don't want to spend a lot of money, um, throw 20, 30, you know, 20, 30, 45 bucks at a set of Cost headphones. You'll get uh, more headphones for your dollars than just about anywhere else. Um, yeah, that's what I'd say. Like, look at Cost, look at uh, the Sony MDRV 6s look at uh, the great OSR 60s, and pretty much anything from, from Biodynamics or Sennheiser. And, and if I haven't listed your favorite brand of headphones, don't hate me, but there are so many people making headphones these days. Oh, yeah, so. tons. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, dude. I mean, I love the idea of having, you know, not having to have multiple sets of headphones, but once you buy a, a USB uh once you buy a USB headset, you're kind of tied into using that with a computer. Uh, and that's just the name of the game on those things. Agreed. All right. I think we're going to wrap it up this week. We would like to personally appeal, especially to all our fabulous new viewers who have found us on the uh, on the uh, iTunes podcast page. I want to thank iTunes for the Best of 2010 Audio Podcast nomination. Thank you guys so much. Uh, do us a favor, email us if you have uh, questions about computer hardware. Uh, Twitch at twit.tv is the place to go. You can find more of me if you haven't been completely overwhelmed and disgusted by now at techzilla.com, T-E-K-Z-I-L-L-A. -L -L I host a uh, video show with Veronica Belmont and Robert Heron where we get our geek on and all sorts of things, software and hardware. Mr. Shrout, pcper.com, what's coming up at the awesome hardware website? So we've got we've got some good notebook reviews coming up soon. I think we're going to look at the Toshiba, or I'm sorry, the Toshiba, the Lenovo T410s. We are going to have, like I said, more graphics cards uh, to look at later in the week. Uh, lots of good stuff. New storage reviews coming soon as well. All at PCPer.com. Also, if you want to watch us record this show uh, instead of just listen, instead of only listening to it through uh, the iTunes or Zoom or however you download that, uh, you can come to live.twit.tv Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. You can watch us record it before you go download it the next day or two, uh, of course, to listen to it again. <laughs> Sweet. So this is episode 99? Well, this was episode 98. Did I just say that instead of wrapping the podcast because I'm a moron? <laughs> well, yes, yes, I I'm, I'm so <laughs> excited. Three, two, ladies and gentlemen, I got to run, got a hot date with the wife. This is very exciting for us having a toddler. Uh, Mr. Shrout, thank you so much, everybody listening. Thank you so much. iTunes, thank you so much. Are you going to be doing some more benchmarking or do you need to go to bed now, Ryan? Uh, no, we're, we're going to be working here a little bit longer before. Before nighttime comes upon us. <laughs> Before nighttime comes upon us. I think that's a, that, that could be the name of this one. Before nighttime <laughs> comes upon us. If that became the name, you will know because you downloaded this already. <laughs> I get a scoop, people. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Trapp. You've been listening to This Week in Computer Hardware. Thanks so much.